back in the early years of the last century, the monks in Bangkok came out with a series of Dharma textbooks, which became the standard all over Thailand, and still is today. When the book first came out, in the first level of the exams that these books were designed for, they defined virtue as restraint of speech and body. Someone brought this to John Bunn's attention. He said, that's wrong. It doesn't mention the mind at all. And the mind is the important part of the virtue. As you look at the training rules, and they deal with intentional actions. And so they sort out what things in your mind you act on. And they give importance to that. It creates a standard. When an unskillful intention comes up in the mind, but you don't act on it, you're not breaking the precept. And so it's not as serious as the actions that you, or the intentions that you do act on. That creates an interesting standard right there, because it's going to be very useful for the practice of concentration. And just li living with yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. All kinds of things come popping into the mind. Remember what the Buddha said. The things we experience in terms of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas. These come from past karma, and you want to look at them as past karma. And then the question is, how do you relate to your past karma? Some things you develop into your present karma, and others you can let go. You have that choice. That's an important point. There were people in the time of the Buddha who insisted that you had no choice, that whatever you're going to experience in the present moment was already predetermined from the past, which meant that you just have to go with whatever's coming up. And as the Buddha said, that leaves you unprotected. You have no way of convincing yourself that you actually even could make a difference. So you're bewildered, unprotected. But if you realize that things come up, but what really matters is what you do with them right now. And you do have the choice of treating them in many different ways. Then you have some protection. At least there's the grounds for protection. Based on that, then you can decide what standards you're going to use. You know, the precepts, the Buddha focuses most attention on the precept around speech. As he said, if you feel no shame at telling a deliberate lie, the idea of something you shouldn't do just is not there anymore. You can do all kinds of things. So restraint has to start with the mouth. That's because the mouth is closer to the mind. And it really reflects what's going on in the mind. So you learn some restraint over your mouth. This is going to be hard for some people. Other people it's not quite so hard. But still, there are a lot of areas in life where we just speak mindlessly. And the purpose of the precepts is to stop your mindlessness. When you say something, you want to be very clear about what your intention is. Whether it's good, whether it's not. Whether it's going to be harmful, whether it's not going to be harmful. And this, of course, is going to be useful as you meditate. You have to be clear about your intention to stay here. And your external speech, of course, reflects your internal speech. How do you talk to yourself? Do you tell yourself lies? Do you tell yourself divisive stuff? Do you tell yourself harsh stuff? Or do you just engage in idle, idle chatter in time, throughout the mind, throughout the day? Because the precepts do come into the mind, even though thinking unskillful things and talking to yourself in unskillful ways is not going to break the precept. At least the fact that you've been trying to observe the precept means you're going to be more careful about what comes out, and then you look more carefully at what's going on inside. 
And one of the important lessons of meditation is learning to see an impulse coming up in the mind in earlier, earlier stages of the impulse to get to the point where it's just simply a stirring of energy, halfway between what's physical and what's mental. And then you slap a perception on it saying, this is a thought about X. And then you ride with it. You start spinning out tails. That's that point where you slap the perception on. That's present karma. You want to get that detailed. And so with the precepts, you start working in this direction. Saying, well, an unskillful thought comes up, I'm just not going to act on it. And you learn some restraint that way. You learn to be mindful, alert, and put forth the effort to make sure you don't act on those things. And then as you sit down to meditate, it just goes deeper and deeper inside. But the basic attitude is still there. Things that come springing up, you don't have to feel guilty about them if they're bad. Just realize that. I don't need these thoughts. And John Lee even recommends that you think that maybe they're not even your thoughts to begin with. There are all these worms and germs going through your blood system, going through your blood vessels. Maybe it's their thoughts. Maybe these are your old karmic debt collectors, as he calls them, as they call them in Thai. Which means they don't necessarily mean well to you. So if you learn how to judge your thoughts as skillful and unskillful, and decide that you're going to identify only with the skillful ones. This is the pattern that got the Buddha on the path to begin with. Judging his thoughts now as to whether he'd like them, whether they were entertaining, whether they were fun to think. But basically where they came from in the mind, what in what sort of intentions, and where they were going to lead, what kind of actions would they inspire? Seeing this part of a causal process, seeing them not so much in terms of their content, but simply in terms of the process of thinking. Here again, this way of approaching your mind is going to be really useful. When you start dealing with issues of becoming, your sense of your identity in a particular world of experience, the way to overcome becoming is not to try to destroy the worlds of experience you have, because that just leads, as the Buddha saw, to more becoming. But you look at the process. How does this world get started? What are the processes? lead up to it. This is where dependent core arising comes in. Here we, are, here we are all the way from the precepts all the way to dependent core arising. It's all the same pattern, looking at things as processes in the mind and realizing you have the choice of whether to go with them or not. If you see the processes that give rise to becoming are causing you suffering, well, you can say, I don't have to engage in them. I don't have to create a world around them. Because that's what we do. We create worlds. We focus on something that we really want, and then we take an identity, take on an identity as the person who might be able to get that, and we'll enjoy having it. And then there's the world in which that whatever it is is going to be located. That's a becoming. So you're going to learn about. How to undo these things, not so much, in, as I said, not in terms of destroying what you already have, but looking to see when the new becomings begin to form, before there really is an identity, just, they're just processes in the mind, events in the mind, attention, intention, perceptions, feelings. Can you keep it at that level? So the psychology of virtue can take you far. It starts you looking at the process in the mind and realizing there are certain things going on there that you don't have to identify with. It is a choice. And then you take that basic principle and you trace it all the way through 
developing concentration, developing discernment. Just getting more and more refined and having a sense of what the choices are. In terms of the precepts, it's simply the choice between acting on an intention and not acting on it. In terms of concentration, it's staying with your breath, staying with that intention, or allowing yourself to wander with other intentions. And you decide to stay. And then you do whatever is necessary to stay, to maintain that intention. Then in terms of discernment, you say, well, how do these intentions create these states of becoming? And where in that process is the craving that leads to the clinging, which is the suffering? So that's all of a piece, this triple training, virtue, concentration, discernment, getting you to step back from what's going on in your mind and realizing you have choices in these processes. And you can begin to direct them where you really want them to go. And your sense of what you really want to, to do or accomplish will get more refined as well. <laughs>